Well, good morning. As LV is LWVCO president, it is my pleasure to be able to welcome you to today's 2021 legislative conference. We have over 240 resident res, res, <laughs> registrants, and we are really happy that you have taken time on this Saturday morning to attend. I'd like to begin by thanking the committee who worked on today's event, League Vice President Barb Winery, Dr. Tony Larson, our Director of Advocacy and Action, Andrea Wilkins, our Legislative Liaison, and Beth Hendricks, who is our Executive Director. These ladies have put in many hours organizing what we hope will be both an interesting and an informative event. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Square State Strategy Group, a full service corporate and campaign fund that is headed by former Colorado Speaker of the House, Frank McNulty. Frank is a great friend to the league. He was instrumental in helping to pass amendments Y and Z. Oops. Well, the tech difficulties just keep going on and on. There, now, is it, is the video working now? Okay. <laughs> Jeez. All right. Um, Frank appreciates the nonpartisan education programs uh, that the league provides for Colorado voters. And so again, our thanks to Square State Strategy Group for supporting uh, us and offering another free educational event. I know that I don't need to tell you all how challenging this past year has been. But even with all of the things that we've been facing, the league has continued to provide voter education, quickly pivoting to take advantage of technology, sometimes more uh, effectively than others, case in point today, uh, by providing virtual forms and webinars and um, using Zoom to be able to stay in touch at the local league level. We've kept track of local state legislation and our league was significantly involved in helping to pass the national popular vote in Colorado. We registered 2,500 voters around the state and provided important ballot issues education through our ballot issues pamphlets published in both English and Spanish and through locally ballot issues forms and radio and newspaper interviews. In doing this work, we have had many supporters, including Frank, and the Allison Rudy uh, Ramsey Foundation, which has funded the printing of our ballot issues pamphlets for several years now. I am proud to be able to say that due in part to the league's work, our nation had a safe and secure election with the largest voter turnout in our nation's history. And all that even while living with a pandemic. Even with our past successes, however, uh, there is still much work that needs to be done and LWVCO stands ready to do its part. We have members who are working on climate change, campaign finance reform, and equalizing access to health care. The board has prioritized the promotion of civil civic discourse, and we have already provided one webinar on the topic with others scheduled. If you're interested, check out the LWVCO website for these dates and for registration information. These events are free. Our mission is to make democracy work for all and 2020 has illustrated how much work remains to be done. So again, I thank you for being here today and for caring about our democracy. All are welcome at the league. We are nonpartisan and we seek to work with all who love this country and want to strengthen our democracy and make it more inclusive today than it was yesterday. We welcome new members. And if you'd like to donate to help promote our cause, it's quick and easy to do so on our website. Now for just a little bit of housekeeping. 
I'd like to ask that all league members, if you would, sometime uh, during the course of today's event, to share your name and your local league affiliation in the chat. And I can speak for the committee, I believe, when I tell you that we would very much appreciate that all of you in attendance today take a few minutes at the end of today's event to use the chat feature located at the bottom of your screen to share your thoughts on what went well, what was of most interest to you. If you have suggestions for future topics or improvements, we would love to have that input because only by hearing from those of you that have taken the time to participate can we make improvements. At this time, I would now like to introduce Dr. Tony Larson, our Director of Advocacy and Action, and Andrea Wilkins, our Legislative Liaison, to get this morning's program underway. Ladies? I believe that I am first, and I'm going to be introducing Beth Malmscog. Well, I hope I got it right this time, Beth. <laughs> um, <laughs> As you no doubt, no doubt know, Beth is a director on the State League Board. She is also an assistant professor at Colorado College in mathematics and computer science. Yay for STEM. <laughs> and her areas of particular interest are discrete mathematics, arithmetic geometry, cryptography, coding theory, and number theory. And for the purposes of the league, she and her students are working on redistricting, particularly drawing the lines. And she has also been working with a group of people who are uh, uh, trying to define competition. So Beth, um, you wanna update us on what's happening with the league and redistricting? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, thanks so much for that introduction, Tony. Um, just as a quick uh, check-in, when does this portion end? I want to make sure I stay on the schedule. 10.30. No. Uh, we, we actually have uh, you and Andrea scheduled first, Tony. You do? I'm happy to go first. I just want to make sure I stay on. So whatever, whatever you like. What do you want me to do, Beth? Hendrix. Uh, wait, whichever, if you'd rather Beth go first, but uh, we do have on the schedule uh, the league's priorities for the 2021 session. Sorry about that, I jumped the gun. That's fine. Okay, so Beth, you wanna hold off for a minute? Mom's Prague? That's and, great. Uh, we've got Beth Hendricks and Beth Mom's Prague, so it's a little difficult sometimes. Okay, go ahead, Andrea, you're first. All right, thank you, Tony. Um, let me share my screen here. Hang on just one second. I've got way too many screens open, really, is I think my problem. And I want to make sure that you all are seeing the right thing. Um, are you seeing the presentation slide? <laughs> does that does that look right? Hopefully, yeah. hopefully everyone's got that. Thank you. All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started talking um, a little bit about um, the legislative activity that's been going on. Um, I'm Andrea Wilkins. The Put it in play mode. Uh, let's see. There you go. There, we got it. Okay, good deal. Andrea, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I, I think the uh, maybe the technical difficulties are just making their way around today. I apologize for that. Um, I think I'm coming in now. I seem to be unmuted on my end, but um, someone yell at me if you either can't see or can't hear, and I will make adjustments. Um, okay, let's try this again. I'm Andrea Wilkins. Um, I am the uh, legislative liaison with the League of Women Voters of Colorado. And Tony Larson and I lead up the LWVCO Action Committee. 
The LAC, probably as most of you are well aware, carries out our citizen lobbying efforts, advocating on league priorities and on legislation that impacts league positions. Tony and I are going to talk to you today about legislative activity of interest to us as an organization, um, including the special session that took place at the end of November um, into the first few days of December. Uh, we'll speak to you priorities that will be we'll be focusing on as the 2021 session gets underway and um, some updates on legislation that has just passed. I'm sorry, for some reason I'm having a hard time advancing my slides. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, as many of you will recall, um, the Colorado General Assembly recently convened for a special session to address urgent needs related to COVID-19 and the companion economic crisis. Legislators convened on November 30th with the goal of addressing emergency needs in eight key areas that included support for small businesses, sales tax relief, childcare, housing, uh, rental and utility assistance, um, expansion of broadband access, emergency food assistance, and um, uh, to deal with our uh, public health response in the midst of the pandemic. Ultimately, 10 bills were passed during this special session. Um, and um, these slides will be available to you after the presentation. And um, you'll see that they, there are links included within um, that you can access for more details on the bill. But I do want to touch on um, some of the specifics and a few of the uh, particular pieces of legislation to, to sort of highlight some of the work that was done. Um, House Bill 1001 provided 20 million uh, to school districts to expand internet access. Obviously with widespread remote learning, uh, the needs for students to have re reliable internet access became critically important this past year, past several months. And while this is a challenge that uh, many schools and families are still struggling with, uh, this bill was intended to help address that problem. Um, House Bill 1002 provided emergency support to both existing and new child care providers to expand the availability of child care in our state. Uh, child care availability has been a huge problem during the pandemic. Um, it's really impacted families' options for the quality early care and education for their children, but it's also disproportionately impacted the ability of women to remain in the workforce. So some efforts were addressed there as well during the special session. Um, there were a couple of measures aimed at providing relief to our restaurants. Um, as we all know, the service industry has been um, among the hardest hit in the pandemic and with closures and capacity reductions going on for nearly a year now, many of them are struggling to survive. In response, legislation was passed to allow for some tax deductions that would permit restaurants to retain more sales tax revenue. And another measure was um, passed that would restrict fees that are charged by third party food delivery companies, which can really, um, you know, just significantly cut into the profits that are earned by restaurants. Um, on this slide, I'd like to draw your attention to, um, to Senate Bill 1, which provided support to small businesses and arts and cultural organizations. Um, there's been some recent adjustments to this bill during the early days of um, the current session that just began earlier this week. Um, and the program for minority owned businesses um, uh, was shifted to the Office of Economic Development and International Trade and funding has been redirected towards um, disproportionately impacted businesses. Um, there was also a deadline extension for distribution of relief payments until April. Um, and Tony's going to be touching on the recent legislation a little bit more in just a few minutes, but um, I did want to flag that um, this uh, bill that passed during the special session has undergone a few adjustments as of late. Um, and as you can see, there were a handful of measures focused on housing and utilities assistance and efforts to provide additional funding for emergency purposes via a transfer to the uh, disaster emergency fund. All right, I'd like to turn now to um, you know, where we're headed, uh, looking ahead a bit. 
Um, there are several priorities that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about as we look forward to the new session. Uh, many of you will recall that we were supportive of last session's multilingual ballot access bill. Um, it's going to be reintroduced this session and we're working to mobilize support around this matter. Uh, Representative Caraveo, who is the bill sponsor, uh, will be joining us to talk about this bill in the breakout sessions. Um, so I, I won't say too much more about it right now, but um, really the goal is to, um, to increase translation of um, ballots into languages offered in the most recent census and to offer minority language sample ballots in counties that meet uh, threshold language criteria. Um, alternative voting methods, including ranked choice voting, is another important area for the League. Uh, Representative Kennedy and Representative Arndt will be introducing legislation that provides for the use of ranked choice voting. Um, and the focus there is likely to be on municipal elections and some consideration on um, um, also uh, including school boards and possible use in presidential primaries. Um, we are still awaiting the draft of this bill, um, so we don't have um, additional details just yet, but um, we expect to receive that soon and we do plan to provide input and stay um, engaged in that process and um, uh, you know, very active in um, any developments on that uh, piece of legislation. Uh, we've also been in, uh, co in communication with Representative Cutter around her media literacy bill, which the League supported last year and um, we'll be mobilizing um, around again this year. Uh, we feel this bill is really a step in the right direction, given our current climate, and um, our hope is that it will bo um, bolster civics education in our state. This year's bill is being sponsored by both um, Representative Cutter and um, Representative McLaughlin. And um, we did just receive a draft of the bill and it requires the uh, State Board of Education to adopt revisions that implement media uh, literacy within reading, writing and civic standards in K through 12 education. It provides technical assistance to school districts on em implementing policies and procedures, best practices, and recommendations related to media literacy. And it requires the Department of Education to create and maintain an online resource uh, bank of materials and resources that pertain to media literacy. So we're excited about um, that legislation and uh, movement that we see is headed in the right direction. Uh, climate and environmental protection measures are always a priority for the League, um, and we are communicating with um, several bill sponsors on renewed efforts to ban polystyrene and single-use plastics. We also know that several of our local leagues are very interested in uh, measures that would address local control over these issues, uh, specifically repealing the ban on local government regulation um, over plastics. Um, so uh, we've been in communication there. We will continue to do that. And um, that's definitely um, a priority that I think, um, you know, like I said, it's always a priority for us, an extremely important issue. It's becoming more pressing all the time. And I know there's a lot of local league interest um, in these measures. Um, healthcare access, affordability, and equity is also always a concern, but especially in a pandemic, um, and we'll be closely monitoring efforts um, here as well. Um, and just across the board, we will be uh, monitoring and lending support to efforts that um, provide relief to families and communities throughout our state, um, given the significant struggles and needs that have emerged, or um, in many cases been made worse by COVID-19 and the economic downturn. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Tony. Tony's muted. Unmute, Tony. Beth, can you unmute, Tony? I got it. I, okay, I, there you go. A special little note came up, so, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess we're all having technical problems this morning. Um, so yes, we have finished with the first three days of the Colorado General Assembly. 
and uh, the, there will be a break for about a month. This can, this can be changed. Um, there's no, that's not a hard and fast um, re, restart date. If, it, if the virus is still flaring um, across the state and, and particularly in the Denver area, uh, they may have to postpone again um, and uh, decide that, that uh, they will have to have a later start. Uh, they're waiting to see also what the effect of the holiday season is on uh, the, the, uh, the virus and how much that ha has um, increased the number of people who have it. And also um, when, if everybody, when people get the, the vaccine. So this start and stop has not been without controversy. Uh, there are particular people within the house that were um, a upset about having to stop. They thought that it should continue. And um, one quote is by scheduling our regular sessions in fits and starts during a declared disaster emergency, the General Assembly is effectively abdicating its duty to represent the people's will to the executive branch, said Representative David Williams from Colorado Springs, a Republican reading a formal letter of protest in the House chamber. In the end, House Republicans who had begun the three-day session with extended complaints about the rules voted nearly unanimously against the resolution to adjourn until mid-February. So this is something that is sticking in their craw. Um, as I attempted to listen to the floor action, um, particularly on Wednesday, January 13th, the first day, I heard either a discussion of the rules or music. So it was a little hard for me to, to follow um, what they're getting down to business so they could uh, pass the bills within the three days, but they managed to do that. So the bills that were brought up in the session, both in the House and the Senate, there were seven of them. Uh, the first one, SB001, is um, modifies the COVID-19 uh, relief programs for small businesses. Um, this is of tangential interest to the league. Uh, we, we were not super um, active in uh, lobbying on these bills. Most of them really do not uh, necessarily fall into our bailiwick, but they're still of interest to us. Um, this one is an, of interest, of course, because of the Colorado economy. Um, <clears throat> their SB002 was extending limitations on debt collection actions. And this, of course, helps people who have, um, who, who have debt and um, other actions and they don't have enough money, of course, to pay for it. So this extends some of that, some of that relief. Uh, Senate Bill 003. Is, is of interest to us. It recreates the Occupational Therapy Practice Act. And um, I think that the reason that this is uh, such a high priority and they decided to take it up early in the session is the fact that um, the Occupational Therapy Practice Act was, was expiring and they needed to have occupational therapists as fast as possible because it's part of the, the recovery of uh, COVID for many people. They have to uh, get some kind of physical therapy to help them out to recover. Um, and then we go to House Bills 1001. And this is remote participation in party committee meetings. And we don't involve ourselves in um, party activities at all, but this just allows the committees now to, to uh, meet uh, via Zoom or whatever cho choice they have, whatever platform they want. So House Bill 1002 um, is the reduction of certain taxpayers' income tax liability. And this is of interest to us. It's a fix to something that was passed in the last session. Uh, House Bill 2014-20 was the bill that was passed. And it the, the new fix um, House Bill 1002 
is um, to help with tax liabilities and the earned income tax credit. Um, and it passed unanimously this time around at the state legislature. Uh, House, uh, House Bill 1003 deals with proceedings of the legislature during disaster emergencies. And then House Bill 1004 is, uh, has to do with electronic wills. As I understand it, it's just uh, allowing, um, instead, of, um, instead of having you know, all the process that you have to go through to have people sign your will, um, this would allow for electronic signatures. So um, the next thing that I'm going to mention is that um, uh, there were lots of people who were very concerned about Senate Bill 1 particularly um, and, and the unequal eligibility requirements that were going that were given in the 20 session the 2020 session of the state legislature so um, that that the issue was that it was designated for minority owned uh, people businesses and um, now I think they have opened that up to be more liberal the general assembly has a adjourned after their meetings, after their three days, and to take care of those urgent pieces of legislation, those that they deemed urgent. Um, and then they also did, did a few other things. There was a Senate joint memorial reaffirming Colorado to be the permanent location for the United States Space Command. As you may have heard, uh, the Trump administration has said that they want to move the Space Command to Alabama. And this was a resolution to say that it should stay in Colorado. Um, and the recommendation from the Air Force is that it stays in Colorado. There was a resolution, of course, commemorating Martin Luther King in both houses. Um, this is something that happens every year, but it's an important activity that the legislature takes up. In addition, the House and Senate committees also heard a few supplemental budget requests from the following departments, from Parks and Wildlife, from Corrections, from Personnel and Administration, Public Health and Environment, the National Western Center, and Metro State University. There was a great deal of discussion about ensuring um, maybe I shouldn't say a great deal, but some discussion, ensuring the public is allowed to speak on the bills going through the process. Uh, they haven't quite yet ironed out how people will be heard um, since we are doing a lot of these things remotely. And uh, we have talked to, we had a meeting with Senate, uh, with the Speaker Gar Garnett's office and we talked to them about this concern. And I know they're trying to address it um, there's particular concern, obviously, about the rural areas um, because of the lack of availability of broadband and adequate speed of broadband. So um, that is what they have done in the three days of the legislative session and stay tuned to find out when they come back, although they are scheduled for February 16th. Thank you. Now, Beth. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Tony. And um, I, I've already been introduced, so I'll just jump right in here. Um, let me share some, uh, share a few slides with you. Um, okay. All right. I hope everybody can see my slides. They look all right. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay. So yeah. I'm great. Um, I'm Beth Malmskog. I just want to talk about what's going on with fair redistricting in Colorado at the moment. So um, this was my introduction to myself, but Tony already gave, told you who I was. Um, I'd just like to do a quick shout out. I'm a professor of mathematics um, at Colorado College, and I work on 
um, fairy districting and mathematics with my wonderful collaborator, Dr. Jen Cleland, who's on the call right now um, at, from the University of Colorado Boulder. We work with a large team of people and have depended on lots of wonderful people across the state. Also a shout out to Rebecca Theobald, who, um, professor of geography at University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, who's been very helpful with this work and is on the call. Um, I joined the state board to work with the League for Fair Redistricting. If you're interested in hearing about the mathematical work and other redistricting perspectives, just email me at bmalmsgog at coloradocollege.edu. I'd love to talk more about this. Um, so I just want to catch everybody up on where we are in redistricting. So after every census, as we know, the um, states need to reapportion or the congressional seats need to be reapportioned to states and states have to redraw the boundaries for those congressional seats as well as the state legislative boundaries to make sure everything has equal population. Um, so of course, um, a great legislative um, uh, and ballot initiative victory here in um, Colorado in 2018, voters and the legislature passed um, amendments Y and Z, which really changed the way the lines are drawn, effectively taking it out of the hands of the legislature um, and bringing it into the hands of an independent commission, which will consist, um, there's two independent commissions, one for the congressional maps and then one that does the state legislative maps. And both of those will be made up of equal parts, Democrat, Republican and unaffiliated voters. Um, so they'll draw the maps They'll choose the maps, um, they, but they will take a lot of public input on this and they'll be greatly assisted by the nonpartisan staff for the state legislature. Um, okay, so how are these commissions gonna look? As I said, there's going to be equal parts, Democrats, Republicans, and unaffiliated voters. They cannot um, be unduly influenced by um, any party um, in the sense that they can't have been a candidate for a federal election or have been a lobbyist, or they also can't be on both of the independent commissions. Um, you, I, I'll let you read this over. Um, these were, were the requirements to apply for the independent commission and be a valid candidate. Um, those applications did close in November. They got about 1,500 applications for the legislative commission and over 2,000 for the congressional um, redistricting commission. So with those applications in hand, where are we right now? Well, this is a great infographic from the Colorado Independent Redistricting Commission website. Like they have the best website. I'll just tell you that right now. And I'll encourage you to go there and see lots of things. This is also where you'll go to submit public comment and to be involved. So I'll just uh, put, get a real pitch for their website. So um, all the, um, you see, we've, we've passed the, um, the first deadlines for the um, commission's closing and the um, selection of these large pools of qualified applicants. Um, right now, we're at the stage of judicial review and selection, where on February 1st, the first um, six commissioners will be chosen through um, this judicial panel. Um, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. That's a meeting that will be open for public comment. Um, as you can see, there's this, uh, this judicial review and selection um, portion, and then there's going to be a legislative leadership selection um, through which another six commissioners for each panel will be selected. And so all of this will be done in March um, so that the commission is ready to get up and running by that time. Um, okay, so what is gonna happen? Well, the nonpartisan commission with the staff of the legislative council are gonna make a pre preliminary redistricting map and they are taking public comments as they develop this map. So this map can't be drawn until the 2020 census data comes in because it's very important that as near as possible, we have equal population in each of these districts. So until we know the population that can't happen, but they are starting to like really think about um, important factors in drawing this map. And so they're taking um, comment and input even now from the public. Um, so once this first map is um, drawn, um, Oh, also, I, I wanted to point out that you can also submit proposed redistricting maps and um, all kinds of public comment, as I said. Again, you can't submit a valid map until you have the census data to make sure that the population is close to equal, but you can start um, with ideas already. Okay, so there'll be at least three public hearings in each congressional district. So these will be all over the state. Since there's seven congressional districts, that means we're gonna have 21 public hearings um, around the state in the first part of the process. At least 10 of the commissioners will attend each hearing in person or you know, by Zoom. And these hearings will be broadcast online so you can attend from anywhere. Um, so there is a link on the website, which um, I'll give you the address um, a little later on, which will let you submit public comment. 
Um, so all of those public comments will be um, published on the web. And oh, sorry, that was went a little by, went by a little fast, but um, the, you'll be able to view other people's public comment as well. Oh, here we go. Okay, so what are the rules that we're gonna follow in redistricting? Um, so the districts, as I mentioned, have to have equal population as near as possible. Um, they have to be composed of contiguous geographic areas, so just one piece. They need to comply, comply with the Federal Voting Rights Act of 1965, um, which is ensuring fairness um, in many different forms. It doesn't, it requires that, uh, that no person's um, right to vote should be denied or diluted um, based on uh, race, ethnicity, or um, other categories. Um, so this also could, just to go back to that real quick, that could also require the creation of um, opportunity districts so that uh, minority groups would be able to elect a candidate of their choice if um, that group is present in sufficient numbers and meets other qualifications. So that's an important thing to be thinking about as we work through this process. Um, also in the laws, um, we need to preserve whole communities of interest as possible and political subdivisions like um, counties, cities, and towns, and they need to be compact, so sort of grouped together. Um, and the final requirement in amendments Y and Z is that this, um, these redistricting plans should maximize the number of politically competitive districts. And this becomes a really interesting question of like, how do you determine what a competitive district really is? And what does it mean to maximize those? Um, like in what reasonable sense? Okay, so two other things, you can't draw districts to protect incumbents or candidates. And um, you need to, again, make sure to um, uh, go ahead and um, make sure that you follow the, the Federal Voting Rights Act um, and do not um, discriminate in your line drawing. Okay, so what do the final maps have to do? Um, so then after all of these hearings, there's gonna be a, a additional maps and the commission can like have a lot of input on what the staff does there. And um, the commissioners can request public hearings and um, or can request at public hearings that the staff prepare additional maps. So there's gonna be a lot of maps going around here. And um, then the commission will you know, seek to work together to agree on a final map. Um, so to select a final map, at least eight of the 12 commissioners, which has to include at least two of the unaffiliated commissioners have to approve that map. And then um, if, you know, if all of this fails, it'll go to the Colorado Supreme Court um, and be decided there. Okay, so here's the really important part that I wanted to make sure we had a few minutes for is like, how can we get involved in the process at this point? Because it really isn't very much of a legislative process anymore. It's a process between this independent commission that's being built and the public in the form of public comment and input. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to bring up is the Observer Corps, which Tony um, has um, been launching. So we're looking for people to observe the process to make sure that these meetings follow the rules. So you can observe meetings. Um, they're all of, like scheduled publicly and you can watch them um, remotely. Um, so the schedule, the a submission portal for comments and a lot more information is available on this, the um, website, which is, this is for the Independent Redistricting, Redistricting Commission. Okay, so uh, Tony Larson has created an observer protocol that has a summary of the rules. So you kind of know what you're looking for when you're watching these. Um, we'll put, go ahead and post that on the League of Women Voters Colorado website um, at some point in the near future. Um, and um, we're also looking to create a formal, a semi-formal observer course that you can sign up and, <coughs> excuse me, sort of stay in touch with the process. Um, the next public meeting that you could observe is February 1st at 2 p.m. <coughs> Excuse me, um, I apologize. And this will be again selecting those first six members of the Congressional Redistricting Commission. Okay, so there's a few other ways that you can get involved and I will share these slides. I see this in the, um, the chat. Um, okay, so one other important way that people can get involved in this process is by sharing, by identifying and sharing their communities of interest with the um, Independent Commission and the Legislative Council staff. So what is a community of interest? Well, it's any group, it's defined to be any group in Colorado that shares one or more substantial interests that have a few qualifications. So it has to be some interest that could be the subject of legislative action. And 
it should be composed of some reasonably proximate population. So it shouldn't be like scattered all across the state because you couldn't really group people that are scattered, scattered all across the state. Um, so things that this could um, be are things like a public policy concern, like um, an urban or rural interest, some agricultural, industrial trade. It could be something like education. So for example, um, the con current congressional plan reflects a community of interest of education, which grouped um, Fort Collins with Boulder in a single congressional district because of the large universities there. Um, employment, environment, um, water, um, there's lots of different um, interests that could um, constitute communities of interest. It could be a racial, ethnic, or language minority group in accordance with the Voting Rights Act. It does not include relationships with political parties, candidates, or incumbents that are serving. Um, so if you have a community of interest or you know someone that you think has a community of interest, let them know about this, that communities of interest will be important in this process. And go ahead and share information about your, um, your community of interest through the Redistricting Commission's website. You can also share it at pu through public comment in meetings. Okay, so another great thing that you could do is kind of make your own maps. So when the census data becomes available, that, that same website that I linked will have a web-based redistricting tool. So you can actually draw your own maps. Um, you can submit them um, on the website again. There are some other great tools, including districter.org, representable, and davesredistricting.org. And those, let you, those can let you play with maps to sort of try and map your own community of interest and just explore the data. Um, if you're really interested in the data that my group has gathered, that's available on districter.org, and you can use the 2010 census data to start practicing drawing maps there if you like. Um, finally, if you just want to learn more about mathematical tools for fair redistricting, I had to put a pitch in at the end here. Um, there's a great website here at mggg.org. That's the metric geometry and gerrymandering group, um, and they're sort of um, pioneers in this area of mathematical aspects of redistricting. Um, and this link right here, which of course I don't expect you to be able to write down, is a link to the paper that my group has written on this. All right, so um, these slides will be available if you want to follow any of these links. Um, thanks so much for your attention, um, and I think that's it. Thank you, Beth. We really appreciate all of that um, really valuable and interesting information. That is fantastic. Um, I, I know that um, we do have some conversation about this in the chat, um, but I also see that um, our next speakers, um, I believe, are both here. Um, so um, in the interest of um, making sure that we accommodate their schedules, um, I'd like to go ahead and move on to that. But um, Beth, if you're not opposed, would it be possible maybe to um, put your um, email in the chat um, so people might be able to follow up with questions and um, clarify things with you as needed? Certainly, yeah, I'll respond to questions in the chat and I'll post my email there and I'd love to um, hear from people one on one. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you. We, we really appreciate your time and all of your information. All right. Um, I'm, I'm really honored to introduce our next two speakers, uh, Senator Dominic Moreno and uh, Lauren Larson. Senator Moreno represents House District 21 and is the chair of the Joint Budget Committee, uh, the committee that is responsible, as you all know, for developing the state budget. Um, he also serves as the vice chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee, the vice chair of the Capitol Building Advisory Committee, and is a member of the Legislative Council and Statutory Revision Committee. Our second speaker as part of this panel uh, presentation is Lauren Larson, who is the director of the governor's office of state planning and budget, state planning and budgeting, uh, where she leads the effort to provide the governor with information and recommendations necessary to make sound public policy and budget decisions and supports the responsible use of state resources through effective and efficient planning, budgeting, and evaluation of state programs. Um, at this time, I would like to welcome and turn things over to Senator Moreno. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. It's good to see uh, friends on this call, including Jean. It's great to see you. Um, uh, so uh, my uh, my name is Dominic Moreno, and um, as was stated, I um, represent Senate District 21, which is in Adams County, um, and also serve as the chair of the Joint Budget Committee. Um, this is my second time um, chairing the JBC. Uh, the first time was um, I'll just say a little more enjoyable because we had resources to 
to allocate, we were able to pass um, free full day kindergarten and of right uh, give you know really uh, needed um, increases to higher education. Um, but the last couple of years we've been in a different place, which is where um, what I want to maybe update you on, and then uh, obviously leave plenty of time for questions. Um, so. In the last year or so, obviously, the pandemic has not only upended our lives, it has also upended the state budget. Um, and we, um, in the course of last year, you know, the legislature was in session when things started to get pretty bad with the coronavirus. And so we ended up pausing um, and we uh, came back later to um, pass really critical legislation, including um, passing a state budget for this fiscal year. Um, but in the period when we took a break, we stayed in contact with the Office of State Planning and Budgeting, as well as Legislative Council. Those two agencies house the state's economists uh, and they provide us information about how the, you know, what the state of the Colorado economy is doing, how the national economy is doing, which then tells us what kind of revenues we have to work with um, to provide critical government services. So we were staying in contact with them and it was not great news. Um, the revenues uh, kind of just had this huge downward turn um, the entire time. And the entire time we were thinking, well, goodness, we're going to have to you know, address this. And when, um, when it was all said and done, we received a, we had quarterly economic forecasts and we asked OSBB and Ledge Council to prepare a, a, a mini forecast to, to give us an idea of where things were at so that we could then balance the budget. And the news that they gave us was, you have about a $3 billion hole to close in the state budget. Keep in mind, uh, the state budget, um, all sources of revenue, right, is, is about $32 billion. So it was about a 10% reduction across the entire budget. The news was even worse for the general fund. The general fund is the most discretionary um, uh, sector of the state budget. It is where your income taxes and your sales taxes primarily go. Um, and the reduction there was about a 25% reduction in the general fund. And so, you know, not great news. The Joint Budget Committee um, had to go to work. We basically scrapped everything we had put together for the budget and then started to uh, make really painful reductions in a variety of different departments uh, in order to get uh, the budget balanced. We have a constitutional obligation to do that at the state level to, to prepare a balanced budget. And so, um, you know, uh, obviously the, the reductions were painful. Uh, the brunt of the reductions were really in our, uh, where most of the general fund goes. So it was primarily unfortunately K through 12 education, unfortunately higher education. They did receive some resources um, from the federal government as a result of some of the uh, relief packages that were passed, but still really painful reductions because I'm sure everyone on this call knows that those are not areas that we fund well anyway. Um, and so uh, to have to make reductions in those areas was, was a really hard call. Um, Fast forward, uh, we, we made it through that. We, we uh, prepared a balanced budget and no one could have guessed this. No one knew this because uh, as the pandemic was raging on, the governor had um, issued uh, a series of executive orders to give people more time to file their income taxes. Um, and so we really didn't know where we stood exactly. Uh, but when all of all was said and done, when we closed out fiscal year 1920, turns out we had a lot more resources to work with than any of us could have expected, to the tune of about 1.5 to $2 billion. Now the challenge, and this is the, uh, what's really difficult to explain to people, is that those are one-time dollars. Because the reality is revenues have declined and they will uh, be at a suppressed level for the next few fiscal years. So that large dollar amount is one-time money. The question being, how do you adequately or appropriately use one-time dollars 
for largely ongoing expenses. That is what uh, you know government does. We have it, it. We don't do a lot of one-time type things. We do a lot of uh, supporting people through difficult times, which is you know over the course of many years. Um, and so that's kind of the challenge that we find ourselves in right now. Uh, we did use a number of those one-time dollars um, to do kind of a mini state relief package. This was before the federal government had passed the most recent relief package, and we were unsure if they were going to do anything at all. And unfortunately, uh, for many people, those who have found themselves unemployed, so many people in the hospitality and leisure sector that has particularly been hard hit by this pandemic, Unfortunately, that federal relief didn't come in time for them. They still had a week lapse in their benefits, but we did a few things like we provided a one-time unemployment benefit of $375 for those folks to hopefully help them. We also um, provided um, some tax relief for restaurants and bars so that they can keep the sales tax revenue rather than remitting it to the state and use that for whatever they need the most. Maybe it's paying rent, maybe it's helping to meet payroll. And then we also pa uh, passed a, a grant fund that also helps um, these, these businesses kind of try to, the ones that have been most affected by capacity reductions to hopefully help them through this really difficult time. We also per, uh, passed some childcare uh, supports. Childcare agencies have really been hit hard during this time. And so we uh, passed a, a grant uh, program for those uh, providers. Um, exciting news there in the federal relief package that ultimately did end up passing. They kind of modeled their relief program after what we did here in Colorado. Um, so uh, as usual, kind of Colorado leads, leads the way. Um, and then we also provided some additional housing and rental assistance um, as well. And so that was a, a mini relief package we met um, in a special session, uh, which are not very common, but the governor called us back right after Thanksgiving to pass those relief packages. So we managed to do that. Now going forward, we will be um, developing another, you know, a, a budget for next year. Again, the challenge being how do you appropriately use one-time resources? Um, and the governor's office, and I, I hope I'm not stealing too much of Warren's thunder, has proposed um, a variety of one-time uh, kind of stimulus proposals to, to kind of kickstart, help to kickstart um, the Colorado economy and get it back to a place where um, revenues are meeting um, the, the level of planned expenditures. Um, and so uh, that's kind of where we're at right now. Uh, the legislature just convened. We just finished on Friday. Uh, we are now taking another pause until February 16th is the planned date to come back. And hopefully uh, things will be a little better by then. Hopefully more people will get vaccinated. We just want to be very conscious of, you know, uh, the, the legislature is a place where people convene. And uh, right now that's probably the worst thing that you can do in a pandemic. And so hopefully more people will be vaccinated. Hopefully um, uh, by then we will be able to, uh, to operate and to convene in a safer environment. But before we left, we did pass um, a couple of really critical bills some around allowing wills to be, um, uh, to be uh, constructed or submitted electronically um, for many people who I think have really felt themselves in, uh, found themselves in isolation, particularly, you know, if you think about folks in long-term care settings, it's just important to make sure that they have, um, you know, all, uh, everything that's needed to to plan uh, if, if, um, if anything really terrible happens. And so we passed that bill. We also passed um, some changes to House Bill 1420. This was a bill that last year we passed um, to uh, the CARES Act, which is the largest kind of relief package that the federal government provided. Um, also included some tax uh, changes. And in Colorado, we have what's called rolling conformity. So anything that is changed at the federal level, we automatically adopt into our state tax code. The CARES Act changes, the tax code changes, primarily benefited um, kind of the, the wealthiest people in Colorado, the wealthiest filers, as well as, um, you know, kind of corporations and that kind of thing. And we decided that that's 
probably not, given the dire straits of the budget, probably not an appropriate thing to do right now. So we did include some changes in House Bill 1420 last year and redirected those savings from, instead of the tax relief going to those wealthiest earners and those you know, corporations, we instead directed a lot of that money towards K through 12 education to help plug some of the budget gaps. But um, the reality is that we, uh, um, there were a lot of fiscal measures on the ballot in November. I'm sure you all are very familiar with all of those given the amazing voter guide that you all put together. Um, and um, the, the, the message was mixed. Um, Coloradans raised taxes in some areas and decreased them in others. Um, the net effect of that was actually slightly positive, about $100 million. Um, so you may remember that some of the taxes that were passed were a tobacco and nicotine tax, um, but they were also lowered by lowering the state income tax. Um, and so, uh, and then we obviously had the effect of the Gallagher Amendment as well, which um, uh, allows local taxing agencies to keep uh, the dollars without um, the rebalancing of Gallagher forcing down the residential assessment rate, which means that there's a positive effect on the state budget as well, because we uh, won't have to backfill the local revenue losses um, for K through 12 education. So uh, that is a lot. I will turn it over to Lauren to fill in the gaps and anything that I missed. And I really look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Senator Moreno. We really appreciate that. And I do see that we have a few um, questions in the chat for you. And I'm sure people are also um, holding some questions that they may want to ask directly. Um, we are actually still waiting for Lauren. Um, she um, needs just a few more minutes, but will be joining us in a minute. So it would be fantastic um, if it's OK with you, if we can go ahead and just shift to a few questions now. Um, I do see in the chat, um, looks like from Beth to Haven, um, she asks, why were the extra tax dollars an unexpected and one-time event? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I noticed um, Maude also provided a little feedback in the chat. Um, and uh, that's exactly right. Essentially, we were operating off of assumptions, not actual filed income taxes. Um, it's really when people file their income taxes that we have a clear idea of what their tax obligation is and thus how much revenue we will have in the general fund. Um, we were essentially guessing because the income tax deadlines were pushed back. And so um, when, when Coloradans did file their income taxes, it turns out uh, that they had largely done a lot better than uh, maybe that, than we had assumed. Um, I think largely because the pandemic really didn't come into play until um, that kind of last quarter of the fiscal year, of fiscal year 1920. And so, um, you know, up until then, the economy was doing extremely well and people uh, were, we had historic low in employment, um, you know, people were, were, uh, were doing well in, in terms of their, their jobs and their take home pay. And so I think largely that is kind of where that large one-time infusion came from. And we had no idea of knowing because we didn't have actual filed income taxes at that point. We were still guessing. Well, thank you for that additional information. Um, and I believe we are in a format where um, individuals can unmute and go ahead and ask a question. Um, I think we should have time for, um, you know, maybe two or three questions um, before Lauren joins us. So um, if you have questions and would like to um, unmute and ask directly, that would be fantastic. Hi, this is Jerry. Andrea, I've got a question for the Senator. Was the COVID money that was received from the CARES Act on budget or uh, included in the general fund budget or was that off budget? Great question. Um, so the CARES Act relief that was provided um, was largely off budget. Um, so there was, um, you know, because um, our budgeting process is not exactly quick. Um, in order to construct and put together a, a, a budget, um, 
a, a balanced budget, we it, it's about a five month process. It, it takes a while. Um, and when we got those resources from the federal government, the, the real interest was how can we get this money as quickly out as possible? Um, we knew people were hurting. We knew um, uh, different sectors of state government were hurting. We knew our public schools were hurting. Our colleges and universities were hurting. And so the, the interest was, let's get this money out as soon as possible. So in uh, collaboration with the governor's office, we did um, uh, agree that the governor should allocate those dollars by executive order. And so um, in essence, by doing that, it became off budget um, because it wasn't subject to the um, appropriation authority of the General Assembly. The governor did um, kind of splinter off about $70 million for the General Assembly to decide how to allocate. And we largely allocated that for small business relief, but also for um, food bank, food assistance, um, uh, and, and food pantries. Um, and so there were a few purposes that we identified those dollars for and that we allocated them for, um, but largely the money was off budget um, and, uh, and allocated by executive order by the governor. All right, um, I, I see Lauren is on and um, I believe we're ready to go, but let's maybe do one more question to um, Senator Moreno and then we will switch to Lauren. Anyone else have a question? I do. Karen Dills from Chafee County. Apparently there was a suggestion to the legislative leadership that legislators from different parties sit together instead of in little rows and that was defeated. But do you think if there were, an, if those people heard enough from the public, they might reconsider that? This came from Gunnison Valley, which is a great idea. Yeah, thanks, Karen. I, I also think it's a great idea. Um, I, and, you know, it's something where um, I, I will say one of the reasons I love serving on the Joint Budget Committee is that it is the closest I've gotten. I, I have my roots in local government. Um, and as many of you know, uh, at the local government level, you don't uh, run behind a party label. Um, and so uh, largely issues at the local level don't become partisan because, you know, it, it essentially doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican, you're just there to solve problems and to try to get um, assistance out the door and to help people. And uh, so, you know, the Joint Budget Committee is the closest I've seen at the state level to that local government uh, ideal that we should um, uh, we should work across the aisle, we shouldn't put party labels first, that we should just work to solve problems. Um, so I've really enjoyed that aspect. And the key tenet of the Joint Budget Committee is we sit together. Um, we sit next to each other, we do the hard work together, um, and we kind of eschew or at least leave behind the majority of that partisan uh, label. And so I do think it's a great idea. Um, I, um, I, I, I I didn't hear about it. Um, and so certainly if I can help advocate with my legislative colleagues that perhaps some this is something that we can consider, should consider. I, um, I do know um, in Congress, they tried this a few years ago where at the, the State of the Union, um, they encouraged people from different sides of the aisle to sit together. And I think, you know, I'm all for any ideas right now that can get us past this really hyper partisanship environment that we're in. Um, I think it's really unfortunate. Um, I think that is, it, it, it's less so at the state level, which I'm grateful for. Uh, it's not as much as in Congress, um, but still um, every bit that we can do to uh, get people to have a dialogue and talk to each other once again, I think is much needed. Well, thank you, Senator Moreno, and, and thanks to all of you for um, uh, chiming in with those questions. Um, we are going to shift now to Lauren Larson, the um, Director of the um, Governor's Office of Planning and Budgeting. And um, if uh, we have time for one or two questions, we'll try and sneak that in as well before we move to our breakout sessions. But um, right now, I will turn things over to Lauren. Thank you, Andrea, and it's such a pleasure to be with everyone today and to follow the esteemed JBC chair. I, I was a, li a little late, I apologize, and so I, I might um, duplicate some of uh, the chair's comments. 
because I, I'm sure he's um, shared with you this really um, interesting fiscal dynamic that we're facing as a state. Um, we, where we're, where we're headed, it, it, it's really interesting in the economy right now. There's a lot of pent up demand. There's a lot of savings in the economy and Colorado was very well positioned before this happened to, um, to, really, to have a very strong position. And we're still at the fundamentals of the economy still look really good. What we're seeing is this hesitation for spending and growth. And that of course contracts um, the, the, the taxes that we're um, receiving into the state. So it's a very, it's an interesting time. And we, we wanna be sure we're poised to take off and uh, and recover from this and be one of the fastest states out of the gate. Uh, and so that's why we're, um, we've, the governor's proposed and we're working closely with the Joint Budget Committee to, to make some investments in uh, stimulative budget direction. So things that would help our economy lift out fast, help us lift out faster, make some needed investments to stimulate. So even though we're in a tight budget environment and things look kind of um, grim from the budget perspective, I think it's really important to devote a certain amount of funds into stimulating the economy to help us lift, to help lift all boats and climb out faster. There's, there's also a, um, a, a, an interesting dynamic in the economy where this recession, this COVID driven recession is really hitting uh, people inequitably. And so we see, for example, um, unemployment rates hitting low income industries, industries with the average wages that are low, much, much harder than uh, middle and high wage industries. And so you end up with a, you know, a tale of two cities sort of thing where you have um, low income folks bearing the burden and increasing the divide, the income divide that was already um, a, a problem in our country and in our state. So the, the General Assembly was um, very quick to act on this in particular in um, late November, early December, when they came back for a special session and enacted some um, stimulus proposals that were very targeted at um, help, helping folks that are hit the hardest from this, um, from this crisis. So that was a great start. And now that um, Congress um, enacted a new bill in December that's helping those, you know, helping through the winter of this pandemic is kind of how I think of it. It's, it's the season of winter and it's also sort of the toughest time as people's savings run out and the unemployment rate is still elevated and we're, you know, still struggling until we can get the vaccine distributed and, um, and get the economy fully open again. So Congress is active. We're really, um, uh, President-elect Biden released his stimulus proposal that's coming up. Um, and we expect Congress to move very quickly on that. And that has um, quite a bit of new funds for state and local aid. The president-elect is proposing 350 billion um, before the, the flip in the, or I guess the last a number that Congress was considering for state and local aid was 160 billion. So this is quite um, an increase over that. And my best guess would be reading the tea leaves here, which is always dangerous, um, would be that we end up somewhere in the middle. And so there will be an, like the CARES Act. And I, I heard the a Senator disc, um, discussing that with you all already. I do think there'll be another um, large infusion protect perhaps even bigger than what we received under the CARES Act that comes through to the state um, very soon, actually quite quickly. So we're busy working on um, trying to um, analyze what might be the best, where the highest needs are, what might be the best place to inject those funds. So um, there's, a lot, there's a lot happening and I'd love to just open it up and um, to the, your members because I, I'm very interested in what's on your minds and it's just such an honor to be here with the League of Women Voters. I, I feel I'm one of a, a few um, women budget directors in the whole country. And uh, I was honored to recently be elected um, president elect of the State Budget Officers Association. Just, and just feeling the, you know, the momentousness of that as a woman and the, um, how proud I am to be a woman in finance and how 
how weighty and important the decisions are that get made with our budget and with our finance. And um, it's, it's just you know, a very deep honor to be at the table. Thank you, Lauren. We really appreciate um, those thoughts and that sentiment. Um, and we very much appreciate both you and Senator Moreno joining us today and sharing all this valuable information. Um, we are a little behind schedule, so if we can maybe do one or two quick questions. But what I would like to also suggest is that if our participants have additional questions, um, if you can put that in the chat, um, we'll be capturing that information.